on this episode of Edge of the Web. You have to adapt to meet customers where they are and give them what they want, where they want it, because they control the buying process now. That's the biggest change. Your weekly digital marketing trends with industry trend-setting guests. You're listening and watching Edge of the Web. Winners of Best Podcast from the Content Marketing Institute for 2017. Hear and see more at edgeofthewebradio.com. Now, alongside Tom Broadbeck, here's your host, Aaron Sparks. So, hey, uh, again, this is the 300th episode. So thanks to uh, everybody who's been listening over the years. Uh, it, we certainly appreciate all the uh, all the reviews and support uh, that we've been able to to garner. And uh, you know what? It's it's been a pleasure to be able to 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 speak so, with some of the top leaders in marketing around the planet. And we're certainly going to be able to kick off 300 with a really great guest. Hey, we're broadcasting from Edge Media Studios downtown in Indianapolis, Indiana. And every week we bring you the latest cutting edge uh, uh, digital marketing tactics as well as marketing influencers, again, from around the planet. You can check out all of our shows over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. We're powered by Site Strategics, the title sponsor of the show. And uh, we special in agile digital marketing. And if you want to know what that is, it's results-based and flexible marketing month to month to be able to focus on your ultimate success and lead generation. How about that? So you want to learn more over at sitestrategics.com. That's S-I-T-E strategics.com. I'm Aaron Sparks, your host, as well as founder and CEO of Site Strategics. And uh, the reason that we do the show, and uh, you know, it's it's a uh, it's uh, it's been repeated, I think, well, probably for 300 times. Yeah, but we want to make sure you know is there's so many different things uh, uh, in the in so many different tactics in the digital marketing space, and they keep on growing and they keep on uh, getting more and more specialized. And we certainly want. Uh, our listeners to be able to understand. So we unpack these concepts on the show, go do some deep diving with guests and be able to really understand the nature of some of these digital marketing tactics and be able to provide that information to you. But we also make sure that we learn at Site Strategics along the way. So we're constantly using this show as a, a learning tool to be able to improve our own skill sets and be able to bring this type of these type of techniques to our clients. So that's why we do what we do. Um, but Tom would say it's just to make money. Right, Tom? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> make the cash. Make the cash. Well, Tom, uh, and, and, and Tom in, in the booth today, he's uh, doing the production. How you doing, Tom? You and myself again. Yeah, Too many stop. buttons for us. <laughs> hey, how's it going? It's good. Well, uh, happy 300th to yeah, you, sir. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's been uh, been a great run. 300, 300 shows. 300 episodes, and you don't see that many podcasts no. actually able to get this to this degree, right? No, especially starting out as a radio show, mm -hmm. local radio show, 8 a.m. on Saturday mornings. Had tons of listeners. <laughs> tens and tens of listeners at that time. So, oh, Boy, that was a, that was a <laughs> rough crawl, like 6.30 in the morning each and every morning up there. <laughs> So uh, I appreciate you being along for the ride the entire time, Tom, and I'm certainly looking forward to the next 100 because we're certainly learning a heck of a lot uh, as we go along. Uh, I want to introduce our guest today. Uh, our guest is Dave Gerthart. Dave, how are you doing today, sir? I just figured I would go on mute also. That seems to be the hot game. <laughs> I'm doing great. You guys are pros. Episode 300 is seriously amazing as a podcast host myself. I know how much effort that takes, especially to make it through the, the if you can make it through the early days when nobody's listening, then I think that's where most people give up. And that's where most people are like, this isn't working for me. So I think you guys are a great case study in, in podcasting and, and in creating content. So thank thanks you for, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you guys. Thank you, Dave. We really appreciate that. And, uh, and uh, let, let, let's hear about your podcast real quick. Yeah, so uh, I have uh, I ho I co host a podcast with our CEO, uh, David, here at Drift called Seeking Wisdom. Oh, cool. And, uh, that podcast actually started before we even had a product really at Drift, where I came into the company as the first marketing guy and, and, and kind of had uh, this challenge that a lot of marketing people have, which is like the CEO has all this amazing. Every time you talk to the CEO, you get inspired. You're like, man, this guy, they had, they, he, he knows everything about this industry. He's talking about hiring, culture, entrepreneurship, this, that. Oh, we should use him. Like, I, I want him to write posts for our blog. And then you're never going to get a CEO to sit down and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, get the time to write. And so uh, I had had a podcast of my own uh, here in Boston called Tech in Boston that I did for about two years where I interviewed local CEOs and founders yep. and had kind of already done a podcast. And so we're like, wait a second, 
you know what? Uh, I have mics, and so why don't I just use uh, why don't I just use the mics? I'm gonna interview him once a week to get content for marketing, and that kind of morphed into like that was a sweet spot, which is like I could never get him to talk alone. But if I was in the in in the room and could say, and tell me more about that, and tell me mm-hmm. more about that, so it, I really use it as a way to get audio to to use for content. But it morphed into this show where you have two people at different points in their career, me kind of just uh, coming up and, and him having done five companies and, and been in the game for you know, 10, 20 years. Uh, and now, it, now it's morphed into the show. We've done 150 episodes. It's called Seeking Wisdom. It's really all a podcast all about personal and professional growth. And so we talk about uh, books we're reading, things we're learning, lessons that are happening, what's happening at Drift, all the way to having amazing guests on the show. That so is that's, awesome. That's the podcast. And it's really been... Uh, it's been an amazing channel for us. Uh, I would tell you that it's been our number one marketing channel. Marketers don't like this because I don't have any way of measuring that. I, there's no, <laughs> there is no perfectly, uh, you know, there's no perfect linear funnel as to like people who convert from the podcast. But I can tell you this, which is, I'm sure you guys feel the same way. The people who listen to the show, man, those are the most passionate fans in the world. Yep. And, and it's amazing. And, and, and how do I know the podcast is a success? Because every candidate that walks into our office says, oh, I, I love this podcast. Every customer we go and meet says, oh, I love the podcast. And so I don't have it in a spreadsheet, but it's one of those things that you feel and the connection from a podcast is like any other marketing channel that we have. Absolutely. And it, it actually goes to the testament and the passion of, of of knowing your space. So whenever customers actually check you out, just like people check, you know, customers check out people's reviews online, if you have a wake behind you of a digital podcast in which you're contributing into the marketing space, those customers see that. And they see your passion and they see uh, really what you're all about before they even meet you, right? Yeah. And I mean, listen, that, that, that's actually why I love this format so much is that it's not scripted. It is not you know, uh, it's not like a play. Mm-hmm. It is me being me and and being real and authentic. And 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 I hope to be the same person that you hear on the podcast as if you met me in the street uh, on a Saturday night out to <laughs> dinner with my wife, right? Like because I think that's what you have to be in marketing today is you have to yep. be really you have to be authentic. You have to be human. And I love podcasting as a channel because it allows that to be real. And and I say silly things sometimes, and I and I make mistakes, and I stutter, and and it's just like it's the realest form. You're getting to hear me and. Uh, I think that's that's become such an important channel for that reason. Is there is not a lot of uh, there's no there's not a lot of ways to hide. There's no the spin. There's no spin, and there's no spin, and and uh, and, and and also I just think you know uh, it's just a format. It's actually been amazing for me from a marketing perspective. I, I realize that the way that I learn is by teaching, and so the more that I can like read a book and yep. then be like, oh, I love that book. Let's talk about it on the podcast. When I talk about it on the podcast, it's that is what then cements it in my mind. Absolutely. Uh, the other benefit has been, I actually think having a podcast has made me a better public speaker because I have more things to talk about, right? If you you guys have done 300 shows, man, you could talk about just about anything. Right? <laughs> You've done 300 episodes, right? And I think the yep. same is true about, it, it really forces you to, every week you got to create a new show. You you got to really be able to flex your creative muscles and say, oh my god, I have nothing today. I got writer's block. Doesn't matter. The show's got to go on anyway. We got to put out a new episode. What are you going to talk about? You're absolutely right. And it also teaches you to be a really good listener. I think because I, yeah. if if you're having a conversation, you, you still have to be part of the conversation. So you te- you you you, you fine tune. I think your listening skills. And and on top of everything else, you get cookies. We've got get cookies. we've got edge of the web celebration cookies right here. Can we give you? Oh, see, there we go. Look at that. They need. Where's the three hundred? You have three hundred. Oh, check it out. There? Yeah, I got three hundred boat back over here. I have another basket over here with tech cookies, and we got a three hundred uh, celebration right in the middle of it. How about that? <laughs> Love it, love it. You should have sent me one. I could have eaten, eaten, it, eaten it with you during that. Uh, you know what? Uh, we got to uh, we got to give a shout out to Cookie Bouquet. You know what? We're probably going to get some over to you. How about that? <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> cool. Uh, well, um, Dave, it's going to be fun. Uh, there he goes. Hey, check it out. Yeah, and, and those are DVDs and Little Mouse, and uh, you know, who knows what a uh, Nokia phone tastes like, but it's right there, right? <laughs> well, we want to. We certainly want to to dive into. Uh, uh, lead response because that's a huge factor in in marketing uh, 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 and just being able to complete the, the the circle. But first and foremost, every time we do our show, we want to dive into some trending topics in digital marketing. You game for that? I'm game. I oh. love I love trends. So All that's... right. Well, let's take you through the latest digital marketing trends. I'm going to do what God put Ron Burgundy on this earth to do. 
have salon quality hair and read the news. <laughs> this week's <laughs> trending topics. And Tom pulled out a Ron Burgundy as well. Oh, say happy 300. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So from Brown, Sir- Al, Brown Cow. <laughs> I, I saw that like three times in a row here just recently, and then the kids walked into the room. It's like, oh, whoa, 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 hold on, <laughs> yeah, probably. Let's 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 change the topic. Let's go to a di- different uh, uh, different part of the show. Anyway, hey, so from Search Engine Land, from Greg Sterling, Google adds voice input and spoken results to mobile web search. So check this out. This is a new move from. Uh, it's on Search Engine Land. It's a new new move from. From Google, it's adding voice input and spoken results on its Android phones. Google has added, added a microphone to the Google search field on Android phones to enable mobile web voice search. It is interesting because you can you could already do that uh, on the phone, but they put this uh, additional icon there. It's a new mic icon, and below the screens from Android on the left uh, in, in the screenshot here, and the iPhone on the right showing Google search results. iPhone doesn't show the mic, although the keyboard allows voice input. The search phrase is, what percentage of mobile queries are, are voice searches, right? So they have an example of uh, the, the screens there. Um, so beyond the microphone icon inside the search bar, the major difference, a significant significant one is that users will hear a spoken response now with Android mobile web searches rather than simply getting a set of silent results. The, the voice response actually may encourage people to undertake more searches while their eyes are occupied, such as if they're cooking or driving. Now, I really just don't condone the whole searching and driving combination. You know? <laughs> It can get people into a lot of trouble. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it'd be a good idea. Not really, no. It's kind of like scanning QR codes. Don't do it while you're driving. Don't do you it, period. We're gonna look, do you ever think we're going to look back in, in 50 years and be like, man, I used to use my phone. People used to use their phone in, in, while they were driving, like how we look back at yeah, yeah, yeah. And other stuff now? Absolutely. Uh, you, you start, you know, hell, you look back at some of the phones we used to have and what we had to do. I mean, it's already making its way into the dashboards of the cars, right? You know, you're going to be wearing your computer. We already are with the wearables, but you're not going to be hamstrung with something in your hand. Right? Aaron, we're going to be computers. We are going to be computers. Exactly. <laughs> See, the Borg is assimilating us, and resistance is futile, and it's called Google. So, Dave, what do you think about uh, uh, the, the continual move towards voice search? Yeah, I mean, look, there, there's a million things we could talk about from a from a consumer's perspective, but but since we're talking to marketers, let's talk about this from a marketing perspective um, I think this this is huge because the the thing that I've been thinking about a lot not not me but there's a bunch of been a bunch of articles written about this and, and we've been talking about a lot internally at Drift and just with other marketers is a uh, huge change in, in SEO coming where yep. Google isn't even sending you traffic right they're answering questions uh, within the search right so you ask a question and they they answer it right there within Google and so that from a from an SEO perspective, that's terrifying. From a from a marketing lead gen, you know, uh, organic content, blah blah blah, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> perspective, because you know uh, we've spent the last decade relying so much on on search traffic and and optimizing things for for search to drive traffic to our site. Uh, but now the future is like not only is Google serving up answers uh, without ever leaving Google, but the other shift is that is you know like you said in that example uh, in the Greg Sterling article, I'm I'm doing my dishes and I ask Google a question and I get answered. I never, I don't never hear from you. I don't ever go to your mm-hmm. website and I never go to your blog. I think that's a huge change that that marketers are going to have to figure out how to adapt to over the next five ten years. Absolutely, and that was the long game that Google's been doing here. Is there there's they're, they're, they're in the in essence they're poaching. The, the choicest information, putting it in their own sandbox, and they're also going towards the transactional side of things. So you're going to be getting quotes to th- from Google to your website, and and uh, there's there's a lot of things that they're they're doing to kind of fence off that their user from visiting you. I, 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 I we've talked about this for years, and it's finally coming to fruition. Um, it's all usability, and people are more and more comfortable with that interface. But my gosh, I mean, from a conversion standpoint, and you're the man about conversions, we got to get them to the website. We got to talk yeah. to them. We got to be able to interact. And Google's kind of yeah. kind of blocking us there. There's that, and then there's also the other the other side of it, which is like Google's really going to control all of the answers, right? Like I don't even have a shot at, at uh, how do I, uh, from a consumer standpoint, they're going to control what news gets to me as a consumer. And so yep. uh, if I say, hey, you know, hey Google, what's the best way to you know wash this this hoodie? 
uh, instead of somebody telling me the answer, Google is going to decide which answer they want to tell me, which is a slippery slope. But look, mm. um, you know, well, that's the tinfoil hat. Uh, <laughs> it's Skynet, take man. Take on this Skynet, right? <laughs> Here I am with my Apple Watch, which is being which is, they're listening to this whole podcast. Um, they know. They know. You know, you know and I, actually lo- I actually love it because I think that SEO has been great, but I actually think it, it's forced... Because uh, because marketers have gotten smart and SEO became such a technical game, I think that it just it, it's become too much of a game. Mm. Uh, I can gamify, you know, I can I can game this article to rank, mm-hmm. and therefore I will get conversions. Where I actually I like this because I think it's going to come back to like the the most creative brands, the best content producers are going to win. Not necessarily uh, whoever has the best you know uh, secret SEO person mm-hmm. to optimize an article. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you got to got to make sure that you're entertaining to that consumer, right? Because they're, yeah, they're yeah. <laughs> ultimately, ultimately Google wants to give Google wants to serve up you know the 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 right answers and and make consumers happy, not marketers. And so yep. uh, I, I'm totally fine with that because I actually think you know the, the the next era of marketing is there are no, I'm reading a great book right now uh, called called The Marketing Rebellion by uh, Mark Schaefer, hmm, and cool. He says he, he's talking about it. Uh, he says you know the the, there's no more. You you can't lie anymore as a marketer. You can't have secrets anymore as a marketer. And I, and I've never thought of it in those words because those are such like real and raw words. But I think it's so true. The the, the future has got to be. You got to win on brand. You got to win on on your employees as advocates. You got to win as your customers as your number one marketer. And so hmm. I, I think there there's this is part of a bigger shift that that's that's uh, happening where the the power is being ripped away from marketers like you and me where we don't get to dictate how uh you know how people get content from us we have to now meet meet customers where they want to get it oh oh amen but you know what and deep teas he'll be on uh, in a couple weeks <laughs> oh yeah yeah very cool well not about the book yeah well you know where you're Come not on. gonna how good is that i didn't even know that <laughs> i know you're good <laughs> he knew yeah hey uh you know what's uh, what uh, where you can't get the answers that's google plus <laughs> Uh, from the Wired uh, uh, news article from Lily Hay Newman, Google take his first step towards killing the URL. So, Tom, uh, what's how how slow or how fast I should say is the d- demise of Google Plus now? It's not the Google Plus. It's the Google just the URL, like how, the way they display URL in Google Chrome. Mm, okay, gotcha. So, uh, so essentially, what they're trying to do is, is trying to prevent hackers from um, being able to mask. URLs and have people click on things they're not supposed to click on. So oh, they're gotcha. so they're trying to show uh, get away from showing displaying a URL within a within a uh, within a address bar uh, because a lot of times you know if you're good SEO you have a clean one mm-hmm. and, but a lot of, a lot of websites you have uh, you know dynamic variables and that sort of thing and so right. uh, the, the, they talked about it here it says in September uh, the security team put forth a radical propo- proposal to kill URLs as we know them. Ah. Uh, but uh, it'll scroll down a little further here. It shows uh, I think it says uh, here it is the the Chrome's team the Chrome team effort so far focused on figuring out how to detect URLs that seem to deviate in some way from the standard practice. The foundation for this source for this is an open source tool called Trickery Trick URI mm-hmm. uh, launching in step with Stark's. Uh, Stark is the person in charge of uh, the Chrome team here. Uh, her conference talk that helps developers check that their software is displaying URLs accurately, consistently. Uh, the goal is to give developers something to test against, so they know how their URLs are going to look through, look to users in different situations. And there was another. There's two different steps, and uh, it's tough to tell for my little screen here behind the booth. Um, but yeah, this article talks about those two different two different ways. The trickery URL is an open source platform that they're using, and then and uh, oh yeah, yes, that. they're yeah. Just, they're just trying to change the way URLs are are displayed, not necessarily kill the URL. Mm-hmm. Mis- the you know the headlines kind yeah, of clickbaity, yeah. but it, 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 it's. <laughs> To change the way it's displayed for users to make it more user friendly. Got it. So the rumors of its death are great, greatly exaggerated right here, right? But they, they they did have some security issues and they they're they're clamping down on that. But they they are still uh, looking at a uh, twilight lighting of uh, Google Plus in April, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they get to do some security hacks and everything. That's yeah. going away in April. Yep. Oh well. So Dave, uh, were you a Google Plus uh, advocate in the day? I, I tried to make it work. I really did. I really did. I tried to make it a channel. Uh, I was at a company at the time, and the company tried to push the channel. We tried to be early on it. 
and it was just always confusing for t- uh, to me you know i didn't and and, and th- of course there the, the real reason we got on there was because there was all these rumors about google you know valuing content on google plus like same way you know youtube is is great for seo right. but uh yeah i mean I, I don't know what to tell you other than other than somewhere my google plus profile is still floating around if you find it please ignore it i think the only thing we got out of it was rel author and that for a very limited period of time right yeah and 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 you know what it it just actually kind of became like everybody let's take what i'm already saying on this channel and just copy and paste it here (laughs) and and hope i build an audience there and so that that strategy never seems to work it didn't work for me it didn't work for medium either so (laughs) that's the truth uh so our last article in the in the lineup here is from recode and we wanted to make sure that we got into a messaging uh story here facebook wants to integrate all of its messaging services will that work uh the analysts actually uh, they've asked some analysts of whether or not uh, this uh, this is about improving Facebook's Q4 earnings, right? So Facebook is planning to integrate all of its messaging services, according to New York Times report, a move that would allow users from each of its standalone messaging apps, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Messenger, to chat with, 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 with one another. It's an interesting plan. Not only would it more tightly integrate Facebook services for potential business benefits, but it would also create what would be likely to be the the largest single messaging network in the world. Three services combined have more than, get this, 4 billion, with a B, user accounts. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. it it could, in in the article, it it could raise some interesting antitrust issues. So... They talk, they talk about regular regularity, regulatory uh, implica- implications and the, and the like. But um, I mean, Facebook diving into uh, into messaging with 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 this type of con- consolidation is it going to help the Facebook business environment? Uh, what do you think, Dave? I, so okay, so I've I've tried to I've read this story a bunch of times and other articles about it, and I and I, I actually don't understand what the buzz is about because it sounds like. It sounds like there's going to be no impact to you and me as end users of right. this thing, and so I guess if you if you, if you're thinking about the monopoly side of it and you care about data and privacy, right, right. And that that's one angle. But from a straight up like messaging is the future, how does this, you know, I, I actually have no idea because hmm. to me it, it just seems like Facebook has you know kind of three unique lines of messaging and they're going to put them all in the same infrastructure uh, so they have one place. But I, I, in my, at least from maybe you understand this differently, it doesn't sound like I'm going to download some new app and all I use Instagram and WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and they're all going to be on one channel, right? Right. Right. Well, I think it may very well be. And again, uh, not knowing the, the, the enormity of this, it, it very well could be a business play for additional uh, advertising support and yeah. be able to uh, cross into that space and make sure that you can distribute into all three uh, unique p- uh, platforms with a consistent message. I don't know. I've, I've not I, liked the I advertising actually, and messaging to begin with. I, I think it's been, I think there's a rule where like every three months, somebody has to release news about Facebook and business messenger and like, is it going to change B2B? And right. we, we just haven't seen it yet. And there hasn't been much there. And so I guess my, 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 to make a long story short, my answer is I will give you a reaction when I actually see something that <laughs> as a, as a consumer. <laughs> this is not news news. <laughs> yeah. I mean, great PR. They just keep getting more of it, whether it's good or bad, whether it's good or bad PR. There's, there's a lot of people. Oh, yeah. As long as you're being talked about, right. Then that's, that's I, in, all that in matters. the case of Facebook. I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure. That's always yeah. There's thing. been a couple of chuckles along yeah. the way. And, you and just... if, you, if you want to get a good take on Facebook, uh, the, the Rico, Kara Swisher and, and Scott Galloway on, on, uh, the recode site, just, just rip Facebook at, at all costs and any opportunity they get. So so you should go check it out. Oh, we will absolutely check it out. <laughs> you know what? You should also check out the newsletter, Edge of the Web newsletter. Check it out. Go over to edgeofthewebradio.com. Download it. Uh, well, you don't download it. You can actually jump in, join it for free. We won't use your email for anything else. We certainly won't message you, uh, except for sending over some great information on a weekly basis. You can text to the number 22828, uh, the word Edge Talk. Don't do it while you're driving. Uh, but uh, join us uh, weekly because we're sending out some great information to you. And uh, we're talking about who we're talking to in the future, who we just talked to, what's, what 
cool discoveries we made along the way, all the news items and much more. So, uh, you know, hey, even a, even a nice pro tip every once in a while. So join the newsletter today at edgeofthewebradio.com. All right, follow all the featured trending topics over at Edge of the Web Radio. But first, let's uh, well, not first. Now, let's go deep dive with this week's featured guest. Now it's time for Edge of the Web featured interview with Dave Gerhardt, Vice President of Marketing at Drift. And the deep voice guy brought Dave to us. So, Dave, how are you doing today in Boston? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here. That This is a really fun format to talk, whip through a little news, and then get to get to warm up. And then yeah. Talk to so I, plus, I dig that. plus, you got a movie trailer, sound uh, 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 background uh, voice guy that's coming in introducing you, right? Love that guy. So I'm doing great. <laughs> Very cool. Let's introduce uh, Dave to our audience. Dave Gerthardt is the VP of Marketing for Drift. And since he joined Drift in 2015 as an employee number six, uh, he has helped create the category of conversational marketing and get 150,000 plus businesses on Drift. Uh, he's also been profiled in more than 100 publications, including New York Times, Forbes, and the Harvard Business Review. His new book, Conversational Marketing, which he co-authored with David Kensel, was released yesterday. Congratulations. And he also examine, examines how companies are using chatbots to, to generate leads. So there's the primer, Dave. Give us, give us your backstory of how you got through the, the channels of digital marketing to be the VP of Drift. Uh, I always, you know, since I was a little boy, I dreamed of being uh, in digital marketing. No, I'm just kidding. I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I actually, you know, I, I graduated college during a time where there was no jobs in marketing. I mean, when are there any, you know, really, it was a bad time and for the economy. Didn't really know what I want to do. My background in, in college was I was a journalism major, which the only thing I knew I was good at was writing. I didn't really know anything else. Um, I found my way in. I needed a job. I found my way into a PR internship. They paid me ten bucks an hour, and that was good, better money than I was making in any other part of life. So, I I, I took that job and uh, ultimately turned that into an in-house PR job at a company called Constant Contact, where I really started to get interested in marketing because mm. I saw I went from being like a, just a PR guy in my mind to, whoa, I'm working with the uh, the product marketing team and demand gen and product managers and sales. And I start to get, see all the inner workings of the company. And I got really interested by that. It was also a really interesting time to be in SaaS. This was uh, 2010, 2011. Social media was exploding. Mm -hmm. My job was, uh, you know, I, I was doing PR for our social media product. That led me to basically follow sites like TechCrunch every day and, and, and really understand what was happening. This was when there was a new article from TechCrunch every day. And it was like you had to read it because it was big industry news early days of, of South by Southwest and all that stuff. Sure. Got super into SaaS, super into tech. Uh, after Constant Contact, um, I worked at a couple other companies. One of them is a company that you, you may know called HubSpot. Mm -hmm. And uh, then from HubSpot, I got, I got to Drift. And so just by, by really coincidence, my whole background has been in, in B2B. I've been a marketing guy at, a, at B2B marketing companies. And so I've really kind of gone deep in this world over the last decade. And, and, and I love it uh, because the tech is always changing. Mm. But the one thing that doesn't change is people. We're always trying to reach people. And so I think as a marketer today, you're, you're constantly having to reinvent yourself. And, and I feel like I've had to reinvent myself every Every three months, just to keep up. There you go. Um, you know that pathway through B two B SaaS companies and marketing companies that that is a unique path because you can start to incubate a very, very um, unique set of skills as opposed to the digital marketing agency uh, uh, roadmap, right? Because you're trying to do everything for clients and a lot of different tactics. You can actually narrowly focus on certain elements inside of the, the the business software that where you were and be able to kind of carve out that niche for yourself right so I mean I can I can truly see the jump yeah. from HubSpot to drift because there's so much of the the interactive pieces and the chat area is and the, and the lead response uh, concepts inside of HubSpot and drift very what very much match up so is that how you kind of formed your career is by picking and choosing some of the the choice skills uh from these uh, different experiences uh, no I, I actually didn't i actually didn't think about skills at all I, i've always <laughs> kind of just thought about uh people all right and 
uh, aligning myself as a up and coming marketer with, hey, I want to be around people that I can learn from. And I think, you know, I, I think this is one of the big mistakes that that marketers early in their career make is they get caught up in, I, I, Dave, I want to be, I meet with a lot of people to, you know, get coffee and, and talk about internships and this and that. I, I read this article, I need to be a T-shaped marketer. Right, you know, right. I, I got to go be an AdWords expert and also be able to blog. And I said, that is great. But to me, my career really changed when I was given the keys to something and great experience at a big company. But what I really learned as a marketer is when I had to go and do it. And so when I joined, uh, when I joined Drift, for example, they had nothing. They had no blog. They had no podcast. They had no video. They had no social media. They had no events. They had no book. And so they had no website. And so I had to be the one to figure out how to set that stuff up. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, 10x my learning is, Hey, buddy, you got to go. You got to go figure this stuff out. And I'd read a million articles about conversion rate optimization, but you don't really feel it until you learn every day. Going to Google Analytics, how many people visit my site? Where are people mm -hmm. dropping off? What's the bounce rate on this page? Okay, why? What can we change? Like to have to do all that firsthand, um, you know, was worth more than any lesson. Now that plus being around the right people, being around companies where the marketing teams have been great and the people are really smart to just soak that in because I'm, I'm not a smart guy. I just have been lucky enough to put myself around smart people and soak it in. And then I think my competitive <laughs> advantage is I just go and I just do stuff. And so I think a lot of people just talk about ideas where yep. uh, I just I execute on them. And this happens all the time. I did something last week. Somebody tweeted at me, oh, man, that was my idea. And here's the difference between that person and, and what I did is, is I went out and did it. And, <laughs> I, and I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm, I'm, I'm confident or cocky or whatever. I'm saying that because I wish I learned that lesson 10 years ago. I wish that instead of being like, I, I wish I had my own podcast, mm -hmm. start a podcast. Right. I wish I had my own blog, start a blog. Because even if you're not doing that for the company, you're going to learn how to do it on your own. So the most powerful thing for me was uh, I started a side project. I started my own podcast and I sold sponsorships. And so I had to figure out how to sell something. I had to figure out how to ask for money. I had to figure out how to set up an invoice. I had to figure out how to do taxes. I had to figure out how to set up a website and set up an RSS feed. And so that was outside of my day job because at the company that I was at as a 23, 24 year old kid, they would never let me do all that stuff, right? It's too scary, right. too risky. So I learned it on my own on the side of my own business. And then now like I'm learning kind of parallel tracks I'm learning what's happening at the company and I'm learning by doing on my own where it's okay if I mess something up because it's my thing, mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to push a bug. It's going to take down the whole site because it's just my little podcast. And so that the combination of being around the right people at work and then having a side project where I got to really touch everything, that was really the formula for me that, that made all the difference. Uh, you're speaking truth, man, uh, is, is that unless uh, there, there is a gap between uh, digital marketers and, and their clients. I mean, they, they can it truly they can, they can practice something, especially if if what I want to say they can they can practice. But they the, the reality doesn't come home until they're marketing for themselves and marketing marketing. Then all of a sudden, every inch that you're that you're adjusting, every tweet that you're adjusting means that much more because it is applying to you and your leads and and ultimately your revenue, right? Yeah, sorry, I muted myself real hard. Um, <laughs> yeah, and look, the, the thing that I was going to say is, but, but ultimately the thing about marketing is, there is marketing theory and marketing theory is great and it's good to read and learn, yep. but you have to do it. There it is. And the reason you have to do it is because it's literally, and no matter how many times you hear this lesson, I still think people don't believe it. Marketing is different for every single business in the world. You have to find out what is going to work for you. Hmm. And there's so many factors in that. It's your industry that's different. It's the product that you sell. It's different. It's your branding that's different. It's the people that are on your marketing team that's different. For example, I do a ton of videos on LinkedIn with my ugly face inside of it, walking down the street, talking, right? That doesn't work for everybody. And so that's totally fine. You might not be comfortable on video, just like you might be better at writing code hmm. or better at writing than I am. And so you've got to find channels that work for you. And so ultimately you have to be able to do something. And I think anybody go and listen to anybody, any, anybody's podcast, any speaker, the best ones are the ones who are talking about their experience. And so even I could give you 20 examples of things that we've done at drift. Mm. It's 
not going to matter. That's it's great to be able to learn from each other, but you got to then go figure out which things you can go apply to your business. And I might tell you advice, and you might come back to me and like, dude, that didn't work. What you told me was wrong. I'm like, mm. well, I don't know your business. That might not have worked for you. What worked for us? Powerful things, man. Uh, <laughs> you need to just go do it and be able to prove and hone something as opposed to just talk about theory. You're absolutely right. Uh, you, you, you went and did something just now. You just released a book, and it's conversational about conversational marketing. So one, let's give us the, give us the title here. Yep, conversational marketing. There you go. And uh, the, the book just came out. So what has the process been like to, to write, edit, and publish a new book? And how have pre-sales gone? Uh, do not write a book. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's actually been a ton of fun. And and so this is also goes back to there's a great marketing <laughs> lesson, I think, in creating this book, which is just like, I just love marketing challenges. And mm. so, hey, we want to write a book. Okay. I don't know anything about writing a book. Great. Figure it out. Like the best, um, I was able to meet the Facebook CMO last year and he had it in, in, in 20 minutes. I said, hey, what, what's your number one piece of advice for marketers? And he said, look, the only secret is the best marketers are able to learn faster than everybody else. And so, and I, and that was so real to me because if you think about it, it really is true. You just got to be able to be like, Ooh, five years ago, podcasts are hot. Okay. I'm just going to go start one. I don't know any of the rules, but I'm going to make my own. And so, um, I went into the book process a little bit blind and just said, I'm going to figure this thing out mm -hmm. ask a couple of people who've done them along the way. And the process was really, uh, you know, two and a half years ago, I actually wrote a book proposal and they got rejected. Oh Yeah which was going to be this book. And they said no, uh, because we didn't have a name for it yet. We called it like, you know, we were just talking about like messaging is the future for your customers. Here's why, right? And we were going to write the book about it. We didn't have a name for it yet. There mm -hmm. wasn't, we had early customers at Drift, but we didn't have hundreds of thousands of people using it like today. Mm -hmm. We didn't have enough case studies and testimonials and social proof. And so um, fast forward to last winter, we had enough good things going on here and, and we said, let's take another crack and, and called up the publisher again and said, hey, can I take another whack at that book proposal? Uh, wrote, wrote a new proposal for the book, title, marketing plan and everything. They accepted it and we've spent the last you know, really six months nailing down the, the book and the writing process and the marketing plan. And, and yesterday uh, was, was the launch of that and we, we did it in Times Square uh, right in front. We... we uh, we bought the NASDAQ billboard in, in Times Square. Oh, nice. Look at that little segment. <laughs> you know, so yesterday I was in Times Square. It was not warm out. We got that billboard. And uh, just that was an awesome event for, for the Drift team and, and our customers and, and community who, who, who've helped kind of create this book over the last couple of years. Oh, man, you got to be proud about that. Con congratulations on Thank that. Thank you. Oh, you're more than welcome. Super proud. Uh, um, and I think the timing was essential as well is that uh, we talked to a number of marketers such as yourself, and, and we've seen a fervor around authenticity and, and engagement uh, in conversation where, I mean, three years ago, four years, years ago, the marketers weren't speaking about that. So you were on to something a couple of years ago, and now the time has come. So give us this concept of conversational marketing, would you? Yeah, I mean, look, on the, on the timing thing, we were just like, I got lucky and was able to draft off of two amazing founders, David Cancel and Elias Torres, who is CEO and CTO of Drift. They had the foresight to start this company five years ago, right? Go. And so... Now the the market is just really getting onto this and and you know product market fit and mass adoption and all that stuff. So they they had the the gut on the timing. Um, I just got to come in and help pull to pull the book together in the in the last year. So the reason why I think the timing is right though is um, back to what we said earlier about you know uh, Mark Schaefer's book and no more secrets, no more lies is that information is free now. So I can find anything I want to know about your business without ever having to talk to anybody at your company. And that has completely changed the game for marketers where 10 years ago, you could basically create this kind of walled garden around your stuff. Oh, hey, you want to know how to generate leads? Great. Put your info in and get my book and I'll teach you how to do it. Where today, you could go watch a YouTube video that I made that's free. Uh, or you could go to an event or listen to our podcast or read our blog. And so people are now showing up to companies, to B2B companies especially, where they've done 90% of the research and they, the sales process has changed. Instead of the sales process being about budget, authority, needs, timing, and, and this big discovery process, the sales process is now like, hey, Dave, thanks for checking us out. Uh, what can I help you with? Why are you here? 
And that that is a complete shift from from marketing and, and how marketing was the last 10, 20 years and, and even rewind back. And so mm. conversational marketing is all about connecting you now with the people who are ready to buy now while they're on your website, which is if you think about it, that's just how brick and mortar stores work, right? If somebody right. walked into your store, you wouldn't ignore them. You would say, hey, hey, hey over there, uh, how you doing? Let me know if you have any questions. That is exactly what conversational marketing does for your website. There's already a presupposition that they, they know what they're looking for. And now you're, you're moving uh, several other steps ahead to be able to be almost like that concierge, right? Yeah, we, we want to bring marketing. Marketing should be a two-way channel. It should be a two-way communication channel. Great marketing should be about helping somebody solve their problems, not stuffing something down their throat saying, this is our way. Yeah. But marketers have kind of, we've lost our way a little bit where we just send an email blast to 100,000 people and God forbid somebody responded to one of those emails. How would I manage that? I just, <laughs> I just want you to register for my webinar here. <laughs> Go to my webinar, right? Yeah, this is getting, so, getting sent from no reply. No, we don't want you to actually engage how there. How many of those emails do you get? Right? I know. Crazy. And so, whereas like, you know, if you really think about it and in its realest form, a, a sale has never gotten made unless a conversation has happened. Hmm. I bought a new iPhone last week. I had to go into the store. I had a conversation with an amazing person who did not feel like a sales rep at all. He knew about this phone inside and out. He helped me. He actually told me to get a cheaper plan. How many sales reps would tell you to spend less money there you because go. he was genuinely helpful. But I also walked into that store and I said, look, I don't want you to walk me through all 15 iPhones. I know I want this one. I know I want it in this color. I'm debating between this and this. And that was an amazing sales process. That is how we all buy. However, most of us then that work in B2B marketing, we go to our jobs in B2B marketing and we do the opposite of that because the tools and technology haven't matched that shift. And so that's the most exciting part about conversational marketing to me It is a scalable way to have those conversations with your customers and still get all the data you need still get all of the lead gen and mm -hmm. tools that you need out of it. So I really, that's the, the part that I get excited about the most. It's about bringing marketing and sales back to having conversations not becoming this one-way, you know, spray and pray channel. And technology, uh, well said. And technology now gives us the the ability to to have those customers at a one-to-one -one space go right into the the community of the business. You're you're you're, you're so right because the the challenge, the, one of the biggest objections early on would be like, well, you know, Dave, that sounds great. It's a very emotional story, uh, but I need to be able to show my sales manager how many conversations we had. I need to be able to track those leads and score them in Marketo and send them into Salesforce, and, yep. and we're like. So one of the amazing things that we had was because we we were early in this market, we got to hear all that feedback. And so we built the product around those objections and pain points to help people. And so we said, look, okay, what's it going to take? We want people to be able to have conversations with the people that are visiting their website. They need to be able to score them and track them in Marketo and send them to Salesforce. And so we're able to learn and really rethink what marketing automation and a marketing system looks like for a world that runs on conversations. And so the future is doesn't matter if you have a conversation on Twitter, over email, on Instagram, on a webinar, whatever. Conversations is are, happen everywhere, and, and, and we want to be the layer that sits between everything. You're really opening up doors of conversation, opportunities for conversations, as opposed to, and, and for our, our listeners who not who are not uh, aware of Drift, Drift is obviously a, a an online chat program that can run right there in, in, in on your website and be able to in, in, interact with any number of uh, uh, pre preset communications before it springs into a live interaction. But it can also go straight into your own uh, uh, organization's Slack, and, and so I love the integration between. Drift and Slack because that now gives your entire employee force the ability to be able to respond to that customer. You're no longer just going through the consumer or the, the sales process. If somebody's got a problem and if you funnel it into your Slack community uh, of, your, of, your, of your own organization, anybody can pick up and be able to interact with that, cus that customer. And now you've got even more authenticity uh, being able to bring those questions straight into the people that can answer them uh, as clearly as possible. Yeah, and and and, and honestly, we, the we, the way we think about it is it's it's a fast lane for the best people that are visiting your website, right? Yeah. There is there is only going to be a very small number of people that are on your website ready to buy now, and so why make those people jump through hoops and go through this crazy process just to talk to somebody? Like, let's get them connected right now. Um, same way that. It's really because all of our expectations in our personal lives have changed. Mm -hmm. After this call, I got to go home 
And so I'm going to go outside. I'm going to call Lyft on my phone and I'm going to get, they're going to, what, what does Lyft do? They're going to say, Hey Dave, we just scanned the area and we're getting the driver closest to you, to you. He'll be here in two minutes. That is how we all expect things to happen in our personal lives, whether it's ordering food, right. ordering stuff on Amazon, ordering cars. And so we really, we're, our mission is to bring that shift to B2B as well. No, very, very good. So it's, it's, it's unfettering communication. Hey, uh, in the first chapter of your book, you talk about how B2B websites are leaking revenue and say 50, and you say 58% of B2B websites are like empty stores. Now, can you talk a little bit about the study you did for this step? Because that's a scary freaking stat right there. (laughs) Scary stat because if you spe- especially if you think about how much time marketing and salespeople spend battling over the quantity and quality of the leads, uh, when oftentimes we're generating enough leads, we're just not actually following up with them, right? And so um, we thought of it like you know, it's it's like an empty store where like here this is the analogy that that we talked about. Uh, David, our our CEO, he 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 told me this story one day, and this is when it really clicked for me. He's like, imagine. You spent all this time, you, you, had a, you had a launch and you wanted to get all these people into your store and you got them into your store, but then when they were in there, nobody said anything to them. They just were ignored, ultimately to leave and go down the street. But it wasn't until that person got home, they walk into their apartment and then all of a sudden the phone rings. Dave, hey, thanks for stopping by my store <laughs> l- earlier. Anyway, and in your head, you're like, why didn't you just talk to me while I was there? <laughs> right? Yep. Yeah. And so that is how most B2B websites operate. And so we had a feeling about this and we've seen it around the web, but we wanted to really test it. And so we did a secret shopper study where we went out to 500 B2B websites. Um, We had a secret shopper fill out forms and measure the lead response time. And basically what we found was, you know, over three, four, three quarters of of people that, that go to a website and get and fill out a contact me form, Mm -hmm. never hear back ever Mm. or, or they don't hear back within five days, which yeah. is an eternity. And so uh, that's really important because if you think about it, if I go to your website and I don't hear back in a day, guess what I'm doing? I'm Googling Drift Alternative. That's and I'm it, going, right there. And I'm going to the next company's website. And so it really is all about response time. But until now, there hasn't been a way for, for people to manage that other than them worrying about, well, what am I going to do? Have people sit there all day and answer? And that's where bots can come, come in and work 24-7, 365. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if your sales team is listening to this podcast right now, they could be getting meetings booked for them. Absolutely, absolutely, and and the the traditional sales team uh, really needs to embrace this this new level of interaction that is expected by consumers. Um, briefly, I wanted to mention a report uh, that was several years back. It was M- M- uh, MIT report about lead response. And I know you're familiar with this then because they ran like 1,500 businesses and they saw that inside of five minutes, if you're actually responding even via email, Inside of five minutes, you have like a 400% chance of converting to a qualified lead. And there are so many businesses that literally were dying in, a, in, a, in, a, in an hour or more. I mean, literally, it, it got them to negative brand if people are responding in like four hours. And, and, and forgive me for getting not off track here, but this is some of our background as we realize that, man, my God, if the businesses don't realize how instantaneous people are expecting them to respond, they're they're losing the game. They're just throwing money out the window. And that's what you're talking about with this, right? Totally. It, especially if you think about uh, the odds are stacked up against you as a marketer today. You're spending all this money. There's so much noise and distraction and atten- like if you can get somebody to your website, why would you not talk to them? And so the, the thought was like, you're driving people into your store only to ignore them. <laughs> like, we got to show people that this is a real problem. And, you know, one of the ways to do that is to actually show them firsthand. Hey, we went to your website. We filled out this form. Mm-hmm. It took five days to hear back from you. You wouldn't buy that way. So, you know, what does what, what, what this show about the, the sales process here? Uh-huh. And the problem is, look, this is nobody's fault. It is technology's fault. Until now, there has not been a better way. And so I, I actually don't think that people, marketing and salespeople, I don't think we, they have had bad intentions and want people to wait. Hmm. There just hasn't been a scalable way to solve this problem. Roger that. Uh, are, so how does li- adding live chat or messaging platform change things in that B2B, uh, in the B2B sites? I mean, there, there has to be a, 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 a acclimation to this environment, but what can it do for a B2B business? 
I think it it brings a B two B business from from later into now. It is you taking go. your B two B business from being a yellow cab company to Uber or Lyft. It is taking your B two B company from being Blockbuster to being Netflix. Like this is how we all mm. expect to be, you know, talk to and communicate with and buy online today. And so the the you know we think about one word a lot at Drift, and that is now. Mm. Most B2B companies were built for later, which is come to my website, fill out this form, we'll route it, score it, and somebody will fill, will follow up with you later, where as consumers, we all expect now. And so I think of Drift as the, the now button for your B2B website. I dig it. Oh, wow. So, all right. So businesses that have a larger staff absolutely can man the, the, the live chat side of things. Uh, what about the smaller companies that who can't even respond to emails and form fills fast enough? How can they man that that, that and monitor that live chat? You know that's always a, a, a resistance, totally. right? No, I, I get that, but I have so there's a couple things that I would want to unpack. If I if I if this was a real business, I would want to understand mm -hmm. why why can you not respond to them? Is it because you don't think it's worth your time? Because I could make the case that wait a second. People come to your website and asking to talk to you. Yep. That shouldn't be a staffing issue. That be that should be like, oh my God, people want to talk to us. We should hire somebody to to actually do this. And so I've never bought into that objection, like that, oh, we don't have people to 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 staff this because if you have enough people come to your website asking for things for your business, like that's a good problem. Those yeah. are the people that you should be talking to. But if you really can't, or you know you're not there 24 seven and always want to provide a great experience. That's where we really think bots have an amazing use case. <clears throat> Excuse me, where your sales team or somebody on your uh, at your company can't work 24 seven 365, but that's where chatbots can. And it's basically like a virtual assistant that sits on your website mm -hmm. and can greet, greet anybody and get them the right answer. So let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, the the chatbot response training because that is also something. Um, yeah. Any business owner should be should or, or sales team should be responding to those those sales forms those sales uh, fill outs very very quickly right and, but but leaving or focusing on a chatbot to be able to answer those questions what the, what's the discipline for a business owner to be able to fill up those answers uh, uh, and kind of walk through what the customer what the customer could potentially be asking what how how difficult is that. It's not. It's not difficult. And, and, and it's as easy as creating like a, a Google form or, or a type form survey. And ultimately, as a business owner, you have all the knowledge. Mm -hmm. you, you know the answers. You know what people are interested in. You just then have to like write a real a couple really simple questions. And I think a lot of times people try to over optimize it. Like mm -hmm. if you've never had a bot on your website, it's not good advice to then go try to make like 15 different branching trees and logic <laughs> for this and that like just start simple right? right you've never done this before say like hey how'd you hear about us oh great are you interested in talking to, into a sales rep like start there mm -hmm. and start having conversations and you're going to learn so much just by what people are responding back and saying to you and so uh, it, it is as easy as as adding a couple questions to like a, a type form survey and 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 hitting hitting play and, and putting that on your website it's that easy folks You've got to be able to embrace that now factor of your business. And, and honestly, culture of businesses need to change as well, right? Yeah, I think that the, the, the shift has to be like, look, you as a business, you do not control the buying process anymore. Your customers do. Mm. And so the, the, the shift for me is, is to think about, okay, how do my customers want to buy and when? And, and, and then how can I adapt everything that we do to be on their terms? Nobody wants to be marketed to. Nobody wants to be sold to. So if you can understand those two things first, then you can start to write a playbook that says, okay, look, if nobody wants to be marketed to and if nobody wants to be sold to, then what does our marketing and sales playbook have to look like? All right. Well, with, with that, that, that unpacks like 15 other things <laughs> right there. Oh, yeah. Um, so... You've got that to work on, but at the same time, you also have to work on uh, like a change of methodology for your for your content and lead generation as well. If you are manning the now space of your business, right? Yes. So can yeah, you I... unpack that for a little bit, if you if you would? What? Go ahead. Can you say rephrase that one? Yeah. So uh, why do we need to rethink our content and our lead generation process as it applies to being able to respond? in the present uh, to a customer. 
So the reason why is because if you can't respond in real time to a customer, people are not going to wait. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, they might wait because there might be no competition in your industry. But today, every industry, every product, there's a clone, a competitor, a copycat, 15 other companies in that category. Mm -hmm. And so if a customer or a potential customer doesn't get the answer that they need, they're not going to wait. You, you cannot afford to wait because there's too much competition. Look, a hundred years ago, if you were the only person that made a red sweatshirt like this, mm -hmm. you could dictate all the rules of how you had to buy the red sweatshirt. If you want a red sweatshirt, you need to show up at this time with this money in this location, bring two friends, and people would come because right. that was the only way to get a red sweatshirt. Today, that would be crazy because I can get one on Amazon, on eBay, on Target. I can Google one. I can go on Facebook Marketplace. I can go on Craigslist. I can get it from a million different places. And so you have to adapt to meet customers where they are and give them what they want, where they want it, because they control the buying process now. That's the biggest change. So, so, cha so changing the content of marketing, giving the consumers more awareness that you will be able to respond real time. I mean, that's that's, yeah. Is 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 that is that is it easy to be able to create new content and new information? Are people, um, our customers, going to respond? to a change in marketing of, hey, hey, we're going to be there right there while you come on our website to be able to respond to that. I mean, is, is that a, a significant shift in content and uh, marketing advertising that you're doing? No, it, it's just, it's just, it, it's, it's a lot. Honestly, it's a lot of storytelling and copywriting, right? Which is, it's, it's about setting expectations. Okay. If you say, I'm going to respond to you in 30 seconds. And if you don't, somebody, you're, you're in trouble, right? <laughs> but the way that we think about it is bots we try to use bots to automate all of the digital paperwork, which is like all of the mundane stuff that businesses have had to use on their website. What's your name? What's your role? What industry are you in? How much revenue do you have? What's your budget? How many employees? All that stuff. Whereas a bot can answer those questions in two seconds. Mm -hmm. And then when you do talk to somebody at the company, you've already jumped through all that. It's like skipping over the phone tree and getting the person that you wanted. I think um, and so... And so that, that's really what it's all about. It's not using bots to replace humans or not trying to answer every question via automation, but it's taking away that so when people talk, mm -hmm. it's a real conversation and, and it's actually valuable. Very good, very good. Um, so it needs to be holistic. Your content needs to, sh to change to, to bring awareness that you are a now business. You need to have the, the paperwork uh, bot uh, filer so you're getting all that, that stuff out of the way so you can clear the lane for a true interaction with your sales team or, or whoever's manning the space. But you also have to have a cultural shift inside your company to a particular degree knowing that the consumers want to be responded to then and there at their time, at their buyer's uh, uh, choice, right? Yeah, there's just, there's just too much noise. If I go to your website and I fill out the form and mm -hmm. it says, contact a sales rep, and then I got to go home, do you think that in three days, I'm going to be like, when a sales rep finally email, emails me, do you think I'm going to be like, yes, <laughs> All right, let's talk tomorrow. No, like I've, I, it's gone. I've thought I like that moment in time has passed. I went with a different company yep. because people like we want what we want and we want it right now. Like I am not, I'm thinking about this thing right now. Not like I'll fill it out. I'll think about it later. Like I just, yeah, I think about it like this, like, oh, my, my, my wife texted me earlier, said, um, Hey, can you pick up something? Blah, blah, blah. I was like, Okay, just went on Amazon, boom, it'll be here tomorrow, right? <laughs> that is how we all want to, to interact, especially in B2B, yep. where nobody's just browsing your B2B website for fun. They are there for a reason. And so you got to make that shift to, to talk to them now. That's it. That's it right there in a nutshell. Well, Dave, uh, let's wrap up here. Uh, I, I mean, honestly, I could... I, I would love to talk to you for another three hours about being in this now right now. <laughs> love it. But, but um, and, and we certainly advocate for our clients to have chatbots, and and Drift is certainly a fantastic, very easy to use product. And and uh, you'd be um, as a business owner, you'd be amazed what starts coming through as long as you're unfettering the the consumers. I mean, giving them a a, a, a way to be able to to land directly on, on on you know on the tarmac with you right then and there, you'll be amazed what what can convert. But uh, well, Dave, I want to ask you a couple questions here to, to wrap up. Uh, we always do this. What bugs you about your industry right now? Um <laughs> man, there's a there's a lot. There's a lot. I think um 
I think that the this whole idea of what works for me is going to work for you. Like you don't have to like everything. Like just me as a marketer, if you don't like the way that I do things, that's totally fine because mm-hmm. you have to have the mindset of I'm going to do what works for my business. So I think it's this, it's this like er, this. Uh, we we live in this world of best practices where people will listen to your podcast, my podcast, a webinar, whatever, and take whatever happens on there as verbatim, mm-hmm. and then say, well. I did the thing you said and it didn't work. Right. Um, you gotta you gotta do what works for you. If if everybody, if you and I were talking about sending emails and you and I said that, hey, we did some research and the best time to send an email is two p.m. on a Tuesday. Uh, un- unfortunately, ninety percent of marketers would then go out next week and schedule an email for two o'clock on Tuesday and expect some magical result. When if a hundred other companies now do it at the same time, these poor consumers are just gonna get flooded with emails from a brand. Mm-hmm. And so. I'm I'm more interested in trying to find our own path and, and rewrite the playbook and and send you an email at nine o'clock on Saturday night when when nobody else is doing it. So I think it's just that which is also hits on this idea of like I think we got to bring creativity back to to marketing. I think we we went too much in the funnel optimization phase of marketing where it's too hard now. There's too much noise. There's too much competition. I think the most creative marketers are going to win. Very good. No, I completely agree on that side. Uh, uh, you got to be unique in in your in your marketing approach. Don't go don't go like lemmings, right? <laughs> All right. Conversely, uh, what excites you about your industry right now? Do you see what I did there? Right now. Right now. <laughs> what excites me is is I think uh, I think this is the most level playing field marketing has ever been because I don't think you can build a moat with content or SEO or video or there there's too many channels now that I don't think you can build a moat with one. You can't have this like hammer that's one channel. Like you have an email database of 10 million people and you can just hammer it harder than your other companies in your space and you can win. There is there is a you know because of technology I have a, a million marketing channels just in my pocket where somebody could reach me. And so I think you can't really pick one channel. And so the thing that excites me is that uh you have to really get creative and and spread your market and place marketing bets on a lot of different things as opposed to like this quarter we're going all in on channel blank. I think you need to have channels two, three, four, five lined up, and those are all going to be input inputs into some you know greater thing that that that's going to get you to your business goal as opposed to our marketing strategy is email marketing. And that's it. <laughs> Excellent. I mean, and it's so multifaceted, and and you can you can you can really put together a very unique machine each and every time you do it, right? Yeah, and just just be willing to always like rewrite the playbook and, and question what what's uh, what's working and what's not, and and anytime something new comes out, be the marketer at your team or on your company that's that's willing to say. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try running ads on Quora because nobody's done it. I'm going to try posting in Reddit because nobody's done it. We're going to try an event because nobody's done it. Like, I think it's just that type of mindset. That's what's going to help you win. Yeah, that kind of wraps up some of the more recent conversations. All these new niche type of marketing platforms are out there. Don't don't go into the main channels. You can really find a lot of great quality and uh, qualified leads uh, by going where they are, right? Totally agree. Excellent. Well, uh Hey man, we certainly want to uh, 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 promote your book. So where can where can we get conversational marketing? Yeah, so come come over to my office right now. I'll give you this copy. No, I will bring um, cookies and we will get a book. <laughs> bring cup, bring cookies. I'll have to bring <laughs> some next time I come to in- Indianapolis. I love it there. Cool. Uh, you can get this book. It's everywhere books are sold. Target, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. But the easiest place is, is go to drift.com slash book. We got a bunch of links there that you can go and get it. And uh, then tweet at me at Dave Gerhardt. Let me let me know what you think. I would love to get your feedback. Absolutely. Well, you certainly and the 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 Edge Nation out here, all of our audience certainly uh, loves uh, hearing from uh, marketers such as yourself. And kudos for the for the new book, man. It's an it's an awesome thing to be able to birth that first baby, right? Yes. Yes. This- <laughs> I actually, uh, the, unlike having a, a real child, though, where I didn't sleep at all, I, I, I was able to sleep in, in the, uh, you know, after this book was produced. That was a big, <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> that was a big kind of breath of fresh air at the launch yesterday, right? Yeah, it was amazing. It was so much fun. Cool. And, uh, that's why I love doing marketing. So. There it is. Well, uh, we certainly want to get some of the social points uh, for Dave. You want to go check him out on his Twitter at dgerthardt. That's G E R H. 
A R D T. Uh, he's also on LinkedIn, uh, Dave Gerthardt, and Instagram, Dave Gerthardt. Um, any final words for our digital marketing audience out there? Keep stay creative. Keep finding new ideas and keep testing them. Don't don't settle for what I do, what you do, what other people in your industry tell you to do. Line up a hundred ideas and 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 stay hungry to test them all and, and figure out what's going to work for you. There it is. Stay hungry and and be in the now. Dave, thanks for being part of our 300th episode. Really appreciate the time, and it's very exciting to talk to somebody with this much passion. We wish, wish you all the best in the in the, in life, man. Thanks, guys. Congratulations, and uh, have me back at episode 600. I think we'll be ready, dude. <laughs> you see what he just did there? <laughs> <laughs> I just set you up for another 300. Episodes. Yikes! All right, well, <laughs> game you on. Guys. All right. Well, thanks for listening to Edge of the Web. Thanks uh, also to uh, all of our uh, listeners and, and audience in Edge of the Web. We certainly appreciate the, the positive feedback, and thanks for downloading and watching the show on a regular basis. Also, special thanks to our colleagues here at Site Strategics. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing here, especially our guest, Dave Gerthardt, for joining us on the 300th episode. Make sure to check out all the must-see videos and more information over at edgeofthewebradio.com. I'm sorry, whoop, edgeoftheweb.radio.com. What do I do that this is 300 episodes and i don't have the url right <laughs> so uh, tom what's next uh, who are we talking to next week We've got scott brinker chief martech on we'll be uh, talking about everything martech everything martech we love that all right so uh, for everybody here at edge of the web and site strategics thanks for listening we certainly appreciate uh, the, uh, the the downloads and the fans uh, let us know how we're doing and hey write write us in and and you know like us and review us too because we certainly love those signals uh, we'll talk to you next week do not be a piece of cyber driftwood bye bye